In modern day politics, it is unfathomable that a politician can make a return to the vice presidency for a third time to share government with his political adversary. But in the youngest nation ripped apart by conflict, anything is possible. <laughs> The last time President Kir and Riyak Macha tried to have a government of national unity, it culminated in a shootout, leaving a coterie of bodyguards dead on the evening of July 8, 2016. Kir revealed shortly after that Macha had arrived at J1 presidential palace with a pistol and was plotting to kill him. When I visited Juba in October 2016, the lasting vestiges of this battle were still visible at the presidential palace. Machar was later pursued with his roughly 1,300 SPLA IO bodyguards from Juba as he fled by foot to DR Congo, where he was rescued, later flown to Khartoum and then South Africa. This was the second time he had escaped. Earlier on in 2013, Machara had fled Juba in a haste after President Kiir, dressed in military fatigue, addressed the nation on television. Alleging that his former SPLM comrade had orchestrated a coup which was crushed. In the aftermath, General James Hoth High, a chief of staff and consummate military officer who had close ties with the late SPLM leader, Dr. John Garang, was sacked. To his allies, Hoth High's cardinal sin was being near the ethnicity of Machal. Paranoia runs high when it comes to ethnicity and the question of allegiance. As Kir lost territory in areas like Bor, the birthplace of Garang, in 2013 and early 2014, his major ally Uganda heeded the clarion call of the battle trumpet. <laughs> Among us, the first journalists to reach Bor after the Ugandan army captured the town, the stench of death permeated this area as the locals struggled to bury the dead. Once a bastion of the SPLA struggle against the Khartoum regime, Bor had become a ghost town with the entire community holed up at the UN camp and a few SPLA militias roaming the streets. In the outskirts were piles of bodies awaiting burial. Since then, a shooting war has resulted in two death and despair as many South Sudanese remain locked in the squalid conditions in IDP camps. Could these be the conditions that jolted the government to act? And Sudan President Omar Bashir's intelligence supremo Salah Ghosh Kir agreed to meet Machar and form a government of national unity. <laughs> Last weekend, these implacable foes met face to face at State House in Tebe to agree on what analysts have termed as the third marriage of convenience. Their cosmetic smiles bellied the deep seated mistrust. <laughs> The Entebbe meeting was meant to hammer out the finer details of a power sharing agreement. Among us, the proposals discussed at the meeting was whether to reinstate Machar as the first vice president and amend the revised bridging proposal by creating a fourth vice president. They also discussed increasing cabinet positions to 55, 30 for the government, 10 for the SPLM IO, and 5 for the remaining opposition parties. If this is agreed, Parliament will be composed of 550 members, the government 400 MPs, SPLM IO 100 MPs, and 50 seats for other opposition factions. 
The negotiations will continue in Khartoum up to the 10th of July. Hopefully, by that point of time, we will arrive at a final agreement uh, on all of the issues. Uh, subsequently, we are supposed uh, to have a third round of negotiations uh, that shall be convened uh, in Nairobi uh, for the finalization of the process in its entirety. To be signed. And you know, the peace talk that was mediated uh, by President Kaguta and cohated by uh, President uh, Bashir was not a new starting point of the peace agreement. Rather, it was to bridge in the, the gap because both of these presidents were mandated by the uh, EGAT and the AU so that they could talk to President Kir and possibly if they could talk also to rebel leader uh, Riyad Machar. There are a number of sticky issues that need to be resolved. For instance, how will Riyad Machar's rebel faction be reintegrated into the national army? There are a number of sticky issues that need to be resolved. For instance, how will Riyad Machar's rebel faction be reintegrated into the national army? How will the rest of the South Sudanese citizens treat the clamor by Kir to extend his term of office until 2021? And how will the other tribes that feel excluded from the national cake feel they are part of this government of national unity? It's a proposal which Machar's group and other rebel factions for now have rejected. It's the skepticism that has greeted the neighboring state right after the death of SPLM's charismatic leader, John Gara. Dr. Francis Mading Deng, a scholar and former UN Undersecretary who served as South Sudan's envoy to the General Assembly, has opined that Garang had a complex vision for South Sudan. It's perhaps a dream that remains elusive for Kir and his disciples. Oh, well, uh, he's a peacemaker. Because uh, if you get a definition of a peace, it's someone who always bring in the understanding which is the opposite of someone who bring in the misunderstanding. That is the definition of a warmonger. A warmonger is someone who brings in a misunderstanding. And uh, a peacemaker is someone who brings in the understanding. That's why he has been running up and down since the inception of the movement. And we continue to, to go on and he is the only one person who could bring peace about. As these initiatives continue, Observers argue that many players have been excluded, including the group of 11 former political detainees led by the SPLM Secretary General Paganamum, former Chief of General Staff General Yai Deng, and Dengalor, who was appointed Foreign Affairs Minister under the Unity Government and has since fled Joba. Former Governor of Northern Balgazel and Chief of General Staff Paul Malong has also joined armed resistance. He named his movement South Sudan United Front and accused President Salva Kiir of running a country where total impunity is the order, saying his movement strives to reverse the practice. But before he rebelled, Malong referred to as King Paul was a popular figure amongst the influential Dinka Council of Elders, a supremacist group that believes the presidency is a good bargain for the tribe's role in the SPLA struggle. He was also the de facto leader and his influence was felt in every sphere of life in South Sudan. On October 3rd, 2016, I spoke to Malong three months after the shootout at the presidential palace. The issue of insecurity was only react and if react is out then nobody will continue with insecurity in the south react have, have, have injected the sickness to his tribe man in very medieval way. React you think that uh, among the sixty four tribes of South Sudan 
a thing that is obstacle is only dinga. And if put it wrongly that the dinka are obstacle and the dinka are cowards. And I will make them to understand. And if you have defeated the tribe he mentioned, then the rest will be followers. That is his an assumption. He doesn't think that the South is belong to the whole tribe of the South. Accused of nursing ambitions, Kir fired Malong and later placed him under house arrest. He was freed for treatment and while away, he accused the Juba government of harassing him and his family, which he claims compelled him to rebel. As Malong prepares for war, the man he pursued could be preparing to return to the coveted seat of vice presidency. It's impossible because our fighting capacity is beyond, we cannot be handled by rebels. Our fighting capacity is, is, is more higher than uh, somebody will use uh, Kalashnikov. This is how complex and notoriously fickle these alliances are. And uh, there are three issues on health. Nobody can make them except only one person. Where will you be born? And what time will you be born? And what time will you die? It's not a making of any one of us. Otherwise you would have known the time of your death. Leave alone the time of your uh, coming to this world. And nobody also who know, including our current president here, he doesn't know who will, who will, will come as the president next. Alongside Malong is Lieutenant General Thomas Cirillo Swaka, a former deputy chief of general staff for logistics who formed the National Salvation Front to fight the regime of Kir. Besides the rebellion, the government in Juba must quickly lift its economy from a tailspin. And that is why we urge those who are busy for uh, talks of regime change to come down because we just came to stay. We are only seven years old. So we urge them to get another business in the security council, but not the South Sudan. With a disillusioned citizenry who equate Kid and Machar to tribal power brokers who want the national cake divided to the Dink and the Nuer, they must find technocrats to fix an economic miracle which will provide services to the underclass of South Sudan. Kid's term in office also poses a question of legitimacy. South Sudan's government has proposed extending President Kiel's term in office for another three years until 2021. Without a clear succession plan, the Troika Alliance, championed by Britain, Norway and the U.S., according to highly placed sources, favors former Foreign Affairs Minister Nihal Deng Nihal to take over from Kiel. A Dinka from Bargazel, Nihal Deng Nihal is a son of William Deng Nihal, one of the revered founders of Anyanya's struggle against the Khartoum government, who was assassinated in 1968. To his Western allies, Nihal is a safe pair of hands who will take care of their interests. The Juba government has not been in the good books of the United States, which was at the forefront of demanding for South Sudan's independence. An agreement has been reached between our delegation and the delegation of the Sudan government in February, late February this year. When South Sudan was granted independence after 2011 plebiscite, China edged out the West after it was given lucrative oil contracts. In the East African neighborhood, Uganda's role attracts mixed reactions. Could it be an arbiter or a conflicted party trying to shore up Kir's government. Before the war broke out, South Sudan was Uganda's major export market, bringing in a billion dollars of revenue annually. <laughs> the South remains a major security concern to Uganda.
South Sudan, while under the Khartoum regime, once offered sanctuary to the LRA and its leader, Joseph Kohn. But as relations between Khartoum and Kampala have thawed, President Museveni believes he, alongside Bashir, once his enemy now friend, can deliver a deal that can guarantee a lasting peace in South Sudan. Yet doubts remain about. Emmanuel Mutaizewa, NTV. Thank <laughs> you.